just take the rust out of the pit. All right, so it's not perfect, but we've got something to work with now, right? <laughs> on the floor and honestly I probably need to finish the floor before I get going too far here uh, that side the driver's side of the truck uh, is more or less done I think I've got a couple welds and stuff to put in this side I've got a massive hole that I just I got burned out I didn't want to do it this panel is my third attempt to cover up this giant hole here and then here's a couple previous attempts. We gotta do something to put this back together here. This is the third body mount that I made. And this will get welded in underneath after it's all done. This will help support the back of the front seat. So we got seat mounts here. There's another set of seat mounts there. And then there's this stuff, which is from the 56 that I caught up. This is the front of the rear seat. And there's not a lot of room between these, but honestly, the seat's quite a bit higher, and then the seat rail is here. So yeah, you're gonna see some seat rail back there, but you got more than enough room to put your feet on either side. It's, it's, the rear seat is gonna be a little cramped, but it's really not gonna be all that bad. Um, so I guess the first things first is I gotta clean up this mess, uh, get this junk out of here and do a little cleanup. So, we'll do that. Now what's gonna end up having to happen is because this was up here on the 56, and I'm going back, this has a taper all the way up to this door jam, and then it goes parallel. And that's one of the other reasons I was using the 56 doors, is they're flat. The 55, and earlier doors have a little bit of a bend here at the bent window, and they're thicker at the front. The 56s are a little bit thinner. But what I'm gonna end up trying to do is continue this bead all the way through and all that, so it looks factory what I've done. But this piece, I'm gonna have to cut it and widen it about 5 eighths of an inch per side to make everything work right. Because these, uh, there's holes in them and there's a particular shape and stuff so it's going to be easier to cut and add material than it is to just move these outboard i know it sounds weird but this is the way i'm going to go have to go about doing this truck so while i'm getting things cleaned out i'm going to go through and i'm going to do a little bit of cleanup on some of the rust and just oil i did try to throw gibbs oil on this so some of this isn't too bad but it's still pretty bad from sitting and you can't weld on rust. So I'm gonna to have to clean this stuff up. These are the hinges that I bought. Uh, they're 49 to 52 Ford truck hinges. There's a front and a, or an upper and a lower. These happen to be for that side. And when you see them, you that was a little noisy um, so I'm gonna clean up the floor uh, I've got just some strip and clean from Home Depot it actually seems to work pretty well and then I use a gray scotch bright uh, and then go back and clean it up after you're done with a little bit of uh, baking soda and water and air dry it really well so that there's no standing water and that seems to last quite a while um, and you, you can't see all of it from there, but there's a lot of rust I'm gonna have to take care of. These are the, the 49 to 52 Ford F1 door hinges. Uh, I'm gonna run these. I've thought about a couple of different plans. Uh, I want a door post uh, and I want conventional opening doors because that's how it would look factory, right? Uh, it's easier to do a suicide door on the rear because you can just take a, a, a hinge post and the stock hinges and you've got plenty of meat back in here to hide all that stuff and then have the both doors lock on the, on the front of it here. Uh, I guess 
it would be cooler having double door handles right in the middle like a continental or something like that but that's just not the way I want it done I want it done my way so that's kind of the whole point right um, I've dealt with a customer's truck that was done with like a Dutch door setup set up that way it was a 54 GMC and the there's jump seats in the back and if you want four people to get in it is the craziest procedure to get into the back and get all the people loaded in so say you're in a, a parking space at a restaurant right and everybody's fat and happy and they're trying to get out so you gotta open the front door then you're gonna unlatch the rear door open the rear door get in close the rear door and then the front door has to close and then the guy who wants to get in the front can open the rear front door and then get back in it's just it's this this it's this dance you have to do I, just my my own experience with suicide door cars you're always backing into them it's just getting out it's not so bad but it's getting in it's just not graceful right and we're so used to getting in a, a normal conventional opening door and this is again this is supposed to be a truck that looks possibly factory that was the whole point is I want I want people to look at this and really question themselves as to how authentic this is that happened with the GMC that we did a couple of years ago um, driving especially driving it around in bare metal uh, nobody realized what we had you know they thought it was an original truck uh, because drip rails and the way the doors fit and everything it just looked really factory so factory would have done an external door hinge uh, they may have done a little bit wider than this 29 30 inch stretch that I'm putting on it but I still want to be able to park it in a normal garage <laughs> So you start getting too long in a normal garage here around Phoenix area, you're not getting it inside. So it just takes up too much space. So let's, uh, let's do a little cleanup here. Let's get all this stuff out of the way and let's get the cleaning. These are hinges off of a station wagon rear deck. You guess, I'm not gonna use the hinges, but the piece I might. So this is what I've been using. Uh, you get it at Home Depot. I don't remember how much it costs. It's not terribly expensive, but it seems to be pretty effective uh, using that and a gray scotch Uh I just put that stuff in a squirt bottle and uh, seems to do okay. Uh, like I said, you just gotta neutralize it when you're done. It is an acid, I think it's a, it's a phosphoric. Uh, I don't know, burn skin. So I'm gonna wear your gloves. You should probably have eye protection, right? I'm gonna get that. All you, all you safety guys are gonna be on me for not wearing eye protection. <laughs> but let's get going. Let's start a little. So with a little bit of scrubbing, that was 10 minutes worth of work. You can see, I'm getting used to holding this GoPro thing. Um, you can see I've got, it came out pretty clean. Uh, and that's just this part. I'm gonna go through, there's some, where this uh, rail was. There's like a tin rail on the back here. Uh, I had taken that off because I'm not gonna put that back on. But there's some old rust underneath there that when it was ready stripped, it didn't come off. And then I've got some acid or something this here. I'm not really sure what that is. I'm going to do a little mechanical abrasion and uh, see if I can get that off.
I might have to switch up to the to the orange red Scotch Brite. See if I can get a little more aggressive with some of this. Giving the acid a little bit of time to activate, to work with the rust, it really does help. Oh, it is, I mean, it's slowly eating away at it and just gives it a little bit more bite into that rust and that'll help lift it up a little bit. It just takes time, mechanical action, scrubbing, sometimes a little burr head or something like that, a little uh, non-woven fiber disc or something like that to get it, uh, to get it agitated and get that acid underneath it and it'll lift that rust up after a while. As far as like rust pits go, no, not moving that. But, and even sandblasting is gonna take a rust pit out. You just take the rust out of the pit. So this part of the floor right up to this edge is the original 54 floor. This is a piece that I made this is the gas or the battery door for the from the 56 and then this back is the 56. This notch here is where this used to live on the 56. Everything's just been moved back a station like that. And uh makes for an interesting patch job, but I think it's gonna work out just fine. Like I said, I've got enough material and I'm just gonna have to kind of put these beads in, collect close this bead and then extend these out make it look make it look factory and you're gonna get to see that here in a little bit protectant on that part and we'll do the front half we'll eventually get to all of the floor but just for right now we're gonna do this and eventually when I get this thing painted uh, there's a there's a powder coater here in town that does really good sandblasting and then they do a powder coat primer so it will go in and seal everything back up so I'm gonna have them do that so all the nooks and crannies, like the pocket down in here, all that will get primered with a powder coat primer and seal up any rust. We prevent this thing from turning into a rust bucket any time soon. It's kind of one of those things. It just takes this kind of stuff, just it's tedious. It takes a lot of time to do. It's thankless. Nobody wants to pay for this kind of work. So you can do it yourself save yourself a lot of money
All right, so it's not perfect, but we've got something to work with now, right? Sorry about the crappy camera angles here. Tough to do. So now let's work on getting this hole filled. And then there's welds and some other stuff that we really need to address here at the end. But I'm just going to work on getting this hole patched up first. And I'll show you the panel. So this is the piece that I made to patch this. And I actually made it for the other side. When I did this, I made a MDF buck with this shape in it here. And I, for some reason, I thought I'll just do two separate ones. I don't know why. I should have made it more universal, but when I did it, I did it this way. But what I ended up having to do was English wheel this panel to get a little bit of a curve to it. Because that's how the floor is shaped. The floor actually drops off on the sides. And where the seat brace is that I put in here, that's flat across, right? So... I needed to have the original contour of the floor and then I needed to accommodate that brace and that's what this bump is for. So I did a little bit of crown to it with, on the English wheel and then I did that shape on the MDF buck, which I no longer have. So I'm going to have to make this one work. So I got to take the rust off of this one and then I'll show you how to close the end and make it look like the other side. Then we'll start trimming it and we'll put in all the bead roll pieces and we'll get to actually do some metal work. So all cleaned up, all the surface rust is off. You can kind of see the panel now. And you can see it. I see how good that rust remover actually works. It's not bad. Uh, there's some little pits, but you know what? We're going to sand and cut and weld on most of this anyway. So it's going to get better as we go. I've got it uh, acid washed and then cleaned up with uh, a little baking soda and water. And then wiped down with some Gibbs oil to kind of help seal it up and protect it. So let's go back and look at the other side that's already done. You can see that same piece right in here, right? Um, so that's that whole section. You can see the little three knocks net to the, just to the right, to the, I'm sorry, to the left of it. Camera's backwards, right? <laughs> uh, that's where that seat platform comes up. So here it is on this side. So here's here's the here's what we've got to do. We got to close this end. Right now on that other panel, it's open right here. So I hammer this down and close it so that it looks more like this. And then we'll go through and we'll put these other notches in here. And then we've got a whole pattern. We've got a bead in it so that everything matches up on that side. I actually got two uh, ribs over there two ribs to, to make it match up so we got some stuff to make so let's lay out what we can and start hammering so what we've got is we got to close this end and there's a couple of different ways of going about it a lot of guys would probably just cut a section out bend it over weld it up let's do this a little more difficult right so we got to come in about five eighths of an inch is where our bend is going to be so Best just mark where it is. So take a tape measure and measure out where your line is going to be. Five eighths of an inch, right? And then just the the easiest thing to do is just scribe it on the back side, even if you need to. So that's where our, our bend is going to go, and we're actually going to go out to this to this corner. We're doing that. So what we need to do to get this to close is this has all got to get shrunk because everything's going to come together and gather up. So a couple of different ways of doing it. One of the ways is what I call a tucking tool. And I actually have one here. Oh, I've got it in my bag. All right, 
So this is, a, this is what I, I call a tucking tool. Uh, if you're new to sheet metal shaping, uh, you probably haven't seen. This is how the coach builder guys in the way back used to, to do this, is he would actually create a dimple with this uh, and then hammer that down and it would shrink the metal together. This, I don't know if you can see it well enough, it's a uh, pair of Harbor Freight snap ring pliers that were broken. So I took a piece of stainless steel tubing and some silicon bronze and buffed the tips round and everything. Uh, so I'll show you that and then I'll show you the other way of getting it done. Let me put my earplugs in. To get started, you need to get in there. Just go right up to the area where you're going to go and you want to turn it. And then turn it back the other way. Do that in a couple places. Okay. And then, I don't know if you can see that or not, but it makes for these little ridges to pop up like that. So that's what you're doing with, these, with this fork is you're creating that little bump. Now, the best thing is to have a dolly underneath here so, you need a couple of good dollies. Find one that, that you can, that you're comfortable with, right? And then take a, you wanna use a fairly flat hammer. When they say flat, you're talking about the dome of this. I don't know if you can see that at all. It's, this one's pretty flat. It's got a very slight radius to it, but it's pretty small, so it's this one I would consider near flat. I've got another one here that is dead flat. I don't use that one very often until we get down to like the finishing stages of the metal. But I like that, I like this one. It's got a good weight to it and everything. So the first thing we do is we want to close these ends. So you can see the end of it is pushed over, right? So that's, that's, you're closing that and then you can tap the rest of this down and that will go ahead and shrink that metal and you gotta just keep doing it over and over again. I'm not gonna go through that because that's a tedious amount of work and I actually have something that'll speed this up quite a bit. This is a Bailey shrinker stretcher. It's a, what they call their deep throat. Uh, there's a couple of different styles. There's the Lancaster style, which just has like a toggle that moves the upper die down. This one, if you move the both the top and bottom work together, there's a cam right in here that twists and push the, pushes it apart. But the dies in here are serrated and they shove the metal together. And if you look at these, you know they're set up right. When you look at them, you can see these dies, the, the gap is offset. If they're parallel with each other, then it's probably a stretching die or they're installed correctly if they're offset to one side. So these, are, these can be flipped around one way or the other. So you want them offset like this because that's going to maximize the amount of shrink and it's not going to create a ridge. Uh, the ridge, it would shove the metal together and actually raise it up. So we don't want to do that. It's going to do some, no matter what. It's going to have a ridge top and bottom. But a lot of that time, you can planish it or sand that off down the road. So that's where we're going to get set up. So now I'm going to take my piece that we've already started with and put that right up in there. And then... I don't know if you can see that at all, but we'll go ahead and choke it up. We'll put a little pressure on it and then we can push this down a little bit. And it'll help get that piece to start tipping down. That's why it's important to have that line on there. And then we'll just shove it over a little bit. So now we're gonna work this down 
keep pushing out the sides on it a little bit. And you're never going to get fully into the side because you, it's not going to go around the bend. This is too flat, right? So, but we need to shrink this enough and, and uh, as on either side that way when we go to hammer this corner in, just like the tuck shrinking style, we've got somewhere for that metal to go. It's going to go into this, this area over here. So that's probably enough to get started. Right, sorry for the awkward shots, but this is, I'm new at filming myself doing this. I just go ahead and do it anyway, right? So I'm going to go ahead and take these corners down and it's, just we're gonna go ahead and finish closing that right so a couple of dollies uh, maybe a different different hammer this is a little lighter but it's got even more crown to it and you want to make sure that the the hammer faces are fairly clean I mean a lot of guys will go through and polish them up and for doing rough work you're gonna scar your hammers up uh, as you do get closer to finishing you're gonna want another set of hammers probably just to do the finish work so that you're not putting scars into your metal. Uh, they're going to tell me, <laughs> I can already hear the comments. They're always going to say, you always want to start with clean hammers, right? And I, I agree, you do. But we're not doing metal finish work. We're getting it just really nice metal work. So there's a little bit of a difference. That's not bad for where we're at right now. That's I think probably a good demo. Uh, this is a brown Scotch Brite on a little Makita, right? We don't want to remove, remove a whole lot of metal, uh, but it's going to be thicker here where we shrink it. So you do have to take some down. We're trying to get those uh, jaw marks from the shrinker stretcher, trying to get that off too. You can see this is still a little low in that corner. So we'll probably have to do a little bit more work on that and get that get that uh, low spot up. So this is where it's going to end up with. I've got some trimming to do. Um, it's going to be this lip is going to come pretty much out to this corner here, but I've got the old seat rail I got to trim. So this is all going to get marked and trimmed back. And I'm going to have to add material, obviously, to this side also, and then trim off the end. But I'm going to, I think that's going to be enough for the day. I uh, have to get back on it next week. Usual stuff, like, subscribe, and uh, let's keep moving. Uh, what, what was the, the old thing? It was like uh, uh, Milton Friedman going to see uh, the, Ch the Chinese and... and uh, he was seeing a bunch of guys out there with uh, shovels digging a hole and Friedman says Why don't you guys have a backhoe and they, and the, the guy that was touring him around says well It's a jobs program So I want to you know if we have everybody using shovels it puts more people to work and Therefore more money gets spent right he's like oh well why don't you guys use spoons? Why use a shovel? Make it even, you can employ so many more people if you just had a shovel, right? <laughs> the idea was the tools make you more efficient. They make you worth more. And you have to have skilled operators for those tools. And going forward, that's kind of what I want to show is like I've got basic hand tools. I've used the big fancy tools before. They, they can make a lot nicer part than ham, hand hammering thing, but that doesn't mean that a handmade part is garbage either. There's there's scales. There's it just takes me a lot longer to do it. So that's kind of what you're going to see going forward.